Tell your neighbor, I am happy to be in church today. Come on. It's a good place to be. It's a good day. And y'all, I'm excited. I'm glad that you're here because you could have chosen to be anywhere and you chose to be in church today. So I'm glad about that. And you are in good company. Look around the room. Look at the good company you are sitting in the midst of. Tell your neighbor, I'm good company. I am good company. Some of y'all don't have to try to be so convincing. You really are good company. I am confident today. I'm confident that God has some encouragement specifically for you today. Somebody want, anybody need a little extra encouragement in your life? Is everybody okay with a little extra encouragement today? Anybody that's like, no, I don't wanna be encouraged. Leave me alone. That's awkward, but I hope that you are ready for some encouragement. How many of you know that sometimes in life, our encouragement, our joy, our hope, in season, sometimes we gotta fight for it. Amen? Anybody ever had to fight for your courage and your hope in certain seasons? Well, amen. Well, today I am trusting that this is your day. You're gonna walk out encouraged. You're gonna walk out lighter. You're gonna walk out excited about all the things that God has for you. I have to say that this week was not a week that I needed additional encouragement because this weekend, which that's a, like, that's a big praise. I'm grateful. I'm, I'm, I'm really bragging about that. But I'm grateful because this weekend, our sweet little Daphne, our youngest daughter, y'all know the one, the, this one? Yeah, that one. She had her very first ballet recital yesterday. We think we have a picture here for you. She should be right behind me in her sweetest little pose. She's just the sweetest. Do you all see why I didn't need additional encouragement? I mean, literally, we can just look at that cute little one and we over overrun with just happiness. Literally during her recital, her daddy wept the whole time. He literally cried. He always says, and guys, really, I'm not a big crier. He's so sweet. He definitely does cry about the Lord and his daughters. Those two things. He does. He cried the whole time. I just had the biggest cheesy grin on my face. Like I'd never, I've never seen any of this before. This is my very first time to see a little girl lift an arm. And it's the best thing in the whole world. But during this week, we had rehearsals and all the fun little stuff that come before this big recital for her. And we were talking, my husband and I were talking with the owner of the dance studio. We were just talking about the things that the Lord had been doing in his heart and in our lives. And he said this one key phrase when we were talking to him. He said that the Lord had been revealing to him that you have to release in order to receive. And in that moment, I said, Ooh, I think I'm gonna take that. Because literally, I mean, it's like if I've got a donut in this hand and I need that coffee that's sitting right there, I gotta release the donut, right? To pick up the next blessing, amen? We have to release to receive. And I believe today there are some of you that the Lord just might ask you that there, there could be something to release today. There could be something to release from your life, to release from your mind, to release from your thinking, from your attitude, so that he can give you the encouragement that he has for you for today and for this season. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Can we take a little extra encouragement? Yeah. Okay, good. Good, let's do it. Y'all got very excited last week for Pastor Sean. You were very supportive. So I'm gonna hear y'all today yeah. understanding. Yeah. Amen, amen. I like it. All right, let me pray for you before we get started. Lord, I thank you right now, Father, for every single person that is listening to my voice. And I pray that you have such supernatural encouragement for them, Lord. Correction, direction, challenge, God. I thank you that you speak so clearly to them through me today and let them leave knowing I heard from God for me. He was talking directly to me. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said... Amen, amen. So last week, Pastor Sean had everybody in the room ready to run, right? Yeah. He had everybody saying, I got up, I got back up, right? Yes, he did, he did. And if you did not, if you don't know what I'm talking about, then you missed an incredible message. So go back online and make sure you catch it because it was very, very encouraging as well. And I am going to run along behind that and add another layer to that. But today I want you to think about something. I want you to think about how many of you would ever say that you have experienced what you would describe as maybe, maybe you said it out loud, maybe you said it in your head, a moment where you said, ooh, that's uncomfortable. 
Anybody ever experienced that where you had that a moment that you were like, oh, that is uncomfortable. For instance, when you see the most well put together person, you know, very, very tidy, very poised, very postured, they've got their life together, right? You can just tell. Like you can just tell if somebody at least on the outside, that's key, looks like they've got their life together. So you see this person very well put together and they're walking directly out of the restroom with a wonderful business suit and a nice stream of toilet paper running along <laughs> right behind them. That's uncomfortable, right? Right? It's even more uncomfortable for the person that discreetly is like, I'm going to save them. I'm going to save them with the old skip and stomp. You know, the one like the... Don't be that guy. Just tap them on the shoulder. Say, excuse me, there's toilet paper on your shoe. Okay? But that's uncomfortable, right? Nobody wants to be uncomfortable. What about when you see a parent with their toddler that's apparently having a meltdown? Yeah, you all go, ooh. The grocery store is the worst, right? They're like, I want the Lucky Charms, please! And you, you see it all. This, this is an uncomfortable moment where a, a child is literally throwing a terrible fit. I, 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 hope that, I hope that this is not a situation you've ever been in, but for those that are watching, you want to look away because you want to save the parent the humiliation, but you also can't look away because you want to know how this is going to end, right? It gets kind of crazy. Toddlers sometimes can be a little crazy because life just has its uncomfortable moments, right? And nobody wants to be uncomfortable. Nobody wakes up and says, this is going to be the most uncomfortable day I've ever had. I can't wait. Do you know anybody like that? That's different, right? That's uncomfortable. That in and of itself. Nobody wakes up like that. No one volunteers to be the person on the middle seat in the airplane, right? Nobody volunteers for that. Nobody's like, I love that seat. Squish between two other people. I don't have any room. I don't have any but my arms. Can't possibly fall asleep. The guy next to me is drooling on me because I'm the closest thing to a pillow. Nobody enjoys that, right? Nobody volunteers for that. Matter of fact, if you are on an airplane, if you're going on a, a flight someplace with someone else and you notice that your seats are separated, what's the first thing you do? You check to see if one of you has a middle seat because you know your fate is sealed to be separated if somebody's got a middle seat because nobody's volunteering to be uncomfortable, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Look at your neighbor and tell them, Nobody wants to be uncomfortable. Nobody does. Today's message is called, That's Uncomfortable. That's Uncomfortable. And there's a story in the Bible I wanna talk about. We're gonna be reading in the book of Matthew. So let me give you a little breakdown of this section of the Bible for those that may not be familiar. The first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these are called the Gospels. And they are called so because they are the personal accounts of four different writers who experienced the life, the miracles, and the redemption of Jesus. And they write their perspective. So this is why you will see similar stories told in the Gospels about the same story that confirm each other's narratives, but with different little perspectives. Same encounter, but different lens. Like if I were to describe this particular outfit to you all, okay? If I were to say, well, I'm just gonna have to try to give you the details of the, the outfit that I'm wearing, I would probably say bright orange hunting shoes, right? Like I would say I'm wearing... Y'all, yeah, hunting shoes, right? These are hunting shoes. No, no, nobody. Okay, bright orange like a hunting vest, okay? Bright orange shoes. Y'all are, y'all are coming with me. I got you. I got you. They're not hunting shoes, okay? They're heels. Bright orange. I would also say the shirt. There's a blue flowers with a white background and some blue pants that are denim but not blue jean, right? So that would, that's probably how I would describe my particular outfit. But if I were to ask my husband to describe my particular outfit, he would probably say, yeah, it's, it's bright, shoes, it's blue. I like it. And that would be the depth of his explanation, okay? Y'all see what I mean? Same scenario, 
but a different perspective. And so often you will see the same story echoed in the different books within the gospel from different perspectives. And this helps us to get a full picture of the story because the stories in the Bible of Jesus's life are so significant to how we live today. Amen? Amen. So we're gonna start reading in the book of Matthew, chapter 14, verse 22. I absolutely love this particular passage. You've most likely heard of it. There's so much to learn from it, but I believe there is something very specific that we are supposed to focus on today. So in the verses leading up to this passage, Jesus and his disciples had just fed the 5,000, which you might have heard the story of before once or twice. They fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish, and they need to, after this moment, cross over into a city called Capernaum, and they have to do that by boat overnight. So let's start in verse 22, Matthew 14, Verse 22, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly after dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear, understandably. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God. So let's break this down here because I'm sure you have heard this story before and maybe you've even heard a particular perspective on it, but I hope that you're going to see it from a different lens today. So Jesus has been praying and we see that echoed in both Matthew and Mark. And this is described in both of those books as the fourth watch. So the Hebrew culture, the fourth watch is the window of time between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. The window in which we all wanna be asleep, right? Anybody ever been awakened between 3 and 6 a.m.? It, it tends to be the hours in which one is awakened. Actually, those were significant hours in the Bible that many significant historical supernatural moments happened at that time. So, hey, if you get woke up between 3 and 6 a.m., you might want to say, Lord, is it you? Just saying, just saying. The Hebrews described this as the fourth watch. So the disciples are out in a boat on the Sea of Galilee when sudden, dangerously high winds and waves arise. And a little history and geography here about this. So a lot of us have probably heard of the Sea of Galilee when you've read Bible stories about Jesus, but the Sea of Galilee actually is just a lake, but it does historically have a lot of storms on it like an ocean. And the reason for this is because the Sea of Galilee is actually at 680 feet below sea level. So it's low, and then there's mountains all the way around it. And they are up around the 2000s in height. So our history here of hurricanes and tropical storms, we understand low temperatures and high temperatures, when they meet, we get what? We get some funky weather, right? We get some things we do not appreciate. And this is what has happened a lot in the history of the Sea of Galilee. This is why you've read in other Bible stories about how there was a storm on the sea. There was a storm on the lake. It's because those two temperatures met and severe weather happened right there. And this is that moment. So it's between three and 6 a.m. Jesus knows that the disciples have gone ahead and the waves are kind of wild, right? He can see this. They have been rowing for hours. The disciples have literally been out on the lake rowing, just trying to get to the other side for hours, but they have been stuck in a storm. Ever, anybody ever get stuck in a storm? I'm, it's not fun to be stuck in a storm. 
And Jesus decides in this moment that he is going to dis- demonstrate to them who he is at this very moment. So he walks on the water out to them. Totally freaks them out. You guys get it? Can you imagine? Has anybody ever seen anybody walking on water towards you? Anybody ever like once? No! because it's not common and it terrified them. They were like, what is happening? We're already exhausted from all the rowing we've been doing and there's a, there's a ghost on the water. They panic. And Jesus says something very interesting here. He says these two words. He says, take courage in this moment. And in the Greek, the word for that is tharseo, which literally means to be courageous, to be bold, to be confident. So he's saying, hey, hey, guys, be strong. It's me. It's me. Don't panic. It's me. And then something really wild happens here. And I say it's wild because it was an invitation that was unexpected. And it's what Peter said. Peter says to the Lord, Lord, if it's you, call me out. Okay. So he says, Lord, I see you out there in the middle of the storm. If that's you, just fight me out into the storm with you. Right? That's kind of a crazy thing to ask for, right? But he does, and what does Jesus say? Jesus' response is, come, simply come. And here's the focus of my message today. I believe this is what happens so often in our Christian journey. I believe we see the Lord in the distance. I believe we feel his direction. We feel his leading, just like the disciples. They saw him in the distance. And when they figured out it was him, they were like, oh, okay. When we figure out it's the Lord that's asking something of us, when we figure out that it's God that's placing something in our hearts, when we figure out that it's God that's challenging us with something, that is the moment that we sense a stirring within us and we say, God, is that you? Are you really asking me to give that up or is that just the enemy trying to take something good from me, right? How many of you have been like, Lord, I don't know if that's you or not. That's what we do. We go, God, is that you? Give us confirmation, Lord. Speak to us. Let somebody else tell us. Confirm it in the word. Remind me in my heart that this is really you. And when he answers, when he confirms, y'all, it's so exciting, right? Anybody ever been there in a moment where you get confirmation from the Lord that you either heard from him or that he is leading you in a particular direction or that he's blessing you with something? It is so exciting, amen? It is literally like falling in love. Like you feel your heart start to race. You get so excited about what is to come, what's next, about this adventure that you could be going on. If you're new to the Lord, it's exciting to know that you are loved by a creator. It's exciting. If you're not new to the Lord, maybe you could look back to a season in your life where you heard from God and you know you did. You know that you felt God asking you to do something, change something. It doesn't have to be the audible voice of God. Just a gentle nudge, like, ah, I should stop that. Mm, I should do, I should, I should apply for that job. I really feel like I should. And then the Lord confirms it by giving you the job. And you're excited, right? There's an excitement that follows. And maybe literally, or maybe only figuratively, we begin to get out of the boat that we are currently in, the season that we are in, and we step towards Jesus. But what happens next is key. If we look back at verse 29, it says, then Peter got down out of the boat and he walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And do you know what happened here? Peter found himself in an uncomfortable spot. He found himself outside of his comfort zone. He'd never been on the water like that before. This was completely new. It felt scary. It was dark out there. There was unknown. And he doubted if he should be right where he was. He doubted in that moment Maybe I didn't hear God right. Maybe God didn't really say, come. Maybe he wasn't like, he wasn't, maybe he wasn't talking to me. Maybe I didn't follow God right. 
Has anybody ever been in a spot where as soon as you face some opposition, as soon as you face a little bit of discomfort in stepping out of that boat, you immediately go, oh, well, maybe I didn't hear right because that doesn't seem like what I thought it was going to be. I mean, I took the job, but I don't really like it. This job doesn't feel great. So I, maybe this wasn't God. Maybe this wasn't God. The Bible does describe that as being double-minded, right? Because it is so easy in our human condition to doubt and question when we see the circumstance looking different than what we had envisioned. How many of you have ever questioned whether you even really ever heard God or not at all? How many of you can think of a time where discomfort made you say, ah, this wasn't what I signed up for, right? I think I signed a different list. But this isn't the list I was on, right? But Peter forgot in that moment about the fact that Jesus said, you, Peter, you come to me. He forgot in that moment because instead he saw the wind and he saw the waves and he thought, ugh, this is uncomfortable and I don't like it. And like Peter, how often after feeling the Lord confirmed that it was his leading, it was his whisper, it was his heart for you after you're all set to jump in, how often do we look to the left and to the right and see the wind? How often do we look at the impossibilities of what God spoke instead of just at what God spoke? How often do we see the waves that seem to be rising up on the sides of us? How often do we shift our gaze from our prize to our opposition? And how often do we decide that because it feels uncomfortable, my God, God must not be in this. This feels uncomfortable. I don't think God's here. How often do we do that? Let me remind you of something today, church. It's from Romans 12, verse two. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Amen? Because the word says that we are to live in this world, but not be like it, right? It says that we are to live set apart, right? That establishes some differentiation, right? That in and of itself can lead us to feel a little uncomfortable, right? So ultimately, the word of God is telling us there is some discomfort ahead for you, but keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on me. Jesus called Peter in to the uncomfortable. That is the thing we rarely see. We just see that he said, come. But Jesus actually said, get out of the boat and step into what will be tremendously uncomfortable for you. Because this is not about you. This is not about what makes you comfortable. This is about who I am. He did not say, I will come to you, Peter. He said, Peter, step out into the discomfort. Step into the storm. Step into the wind. Step into the uncertain elements. Step into the things that you cannot control. Come to me because I am the great I am. He says, I am the God of the breakthrough. I am the God of the provision. I am the God of the unknown. I am the God of the restoration. I am the God of the supernatural. I am the great I am. Those waves are just waves, but I am the great I am. You see, God is all of the things that we need for the calling, for the assignment, for the circumstance, for the answered prayer, for the unanswered prayer, for the miraculous need, for the weakness, for the strength. But how much bigger is the need than ourselves? That is the thing that Jesus is continuously reminding us of. Our need for Jesus is greater than our absolute ability in any setting. 
How many of you would say, I want to be and leave a greater mark than just myself, than just my abilities, than just what I'm capable of? This is where we establish that our need for Jesus doesn't end at 3 a.m. Our need for Jesus doesn't end at bedtime. Our need for Jesus doesn't end when we clock out. Our need for Jesus doesn't end once we have decided, I got it. Because as soon as you have got it, it's time to give it up. Because it's not about you. It's about what God can do through you and what God can do for you because of his great love for us and his understanding of who we are and what we need. And how often in these uncomfortable moments, outside of our comfort zone, do we allow the discomfort of what he called us out of and into to cause us to doubt if we can do it? Let me make it really plain and really clear for you. Without Jesus, you can't. You absolutely can't. Whatsoever. So if you are wondering if you can do it, you are looking in the wrong direction already. You've already set off on the wrong foot because it is not about what you are capable of. It is about what the great creator asked of you and called you to because y'all, he created you from the moment. So he placed inside of you the ability to do this thing that he placed in front of you. But if you stepped up to it with full confidence saying, nah, I got this, then you would have no need of Jesus. So discomfort and storms and waves, that's life. And sometimes those challenges are a good reminder of, I just gotta keep leaning on you, Jesus. I've just gotta keep pressed into you, Jesus. I'm falling too far back. I gotta get right back in to your presence because that's why he called Peter to come to him because the provision is in him, not in our abilities. It's not in the boat. It's in Jesus, and we have to step closer and closer to Jesus to be and do all that he places in our hearts and paths. Pastor Sean reminded us last week of John 16, that says, in this world, you will have trouble. You will have difficulties and situations and things that make you uncomfortable, things you don't know the solutions to. You will have those, but... He says the same two words here that he said to the disciples in the boat, but take heart for I have overcome the world. Every wave, every storm, every uncomfortable moment, he's already overcome it. So when you step into it, you step out of that boat and you step into the discomfort, you step into it with the understanding that I see you waves. I see you storm. I see you things that I don't know what to do with, but I do serve a God that does know. I do serve a God that does see. I do sit in a position of understanding that God has already gone before me. So what I want you to grab today and what I believe the Holy Spirit wants to impart to you today is simply courage. Courage for what is in front of you Courage for what you may have stepped away from. Courage for what you feel like maybe you are sinking in the middle of right now, just like Peter. Because Joshua 1.9 says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I believe Jesus is calling us as his church in this season specifically to have more courage, to have more trust in him, more confidence, to let him lead, more peace in the midst of discomfort. And I wanna give you three ways today to take home, to be confident and uncomfortable at the same time. Three ways to be confident and uncomfortable. Number one, Write these down if you can. Number one, focus. Focus. Focus more on how God leads than how you feel. 
Because God needs your focus on him more than you need to give attention to the anxiety and the worry and the fear that you feel about not knowing when and how to proceed. You need to give your focus and your attention to the one who directed you. Isaiah 42, 16 says, I will lead the blind. Now this does speak of those literally physically blind, but it also speaks of those who are living in a situation where they cannot see. Maybe it's voluntary. Maybe the Lord hasn't revealed it yet. But he says, I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. Anybody ever tripped, fallen down? Man, I feel like I've tripped more than, than I would like to think about because I do not describe myself as a clumsy person. But anybody ever caught your like foot on like the edge of something that you're like, that wasn't there. There was nothing there. I just, I just tripped. How many of you know it's nice to know that you are walking on a smooth surface? No spots to stumble, no spots to trip. This is the promise of God. He says, and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. Y'all, this is the God that we follow. He is aware that we do not see it all clearly. I think sometimes we're like, oh no, like I don't, I don't know where I am. Lord, do you know that? Do you know that I can't see it? Lord, do you know that I'm not aware of everything that's happening? Have you ever found yourself like, God, do you hear me? Do you realize that I am feeling a little lost in this moment? Sometimes we're like, I'm not sure if God knows that I don't know what I'm supposed to do next, which is a pretty silly thought because he's literally waiting to reveal it. So he leads us, but our eyes must be fixed on him in the word, in prayer, in worship. Processing our feelings is imperative. It is most definitely necessary. I tell you that as both a pastor and a counselor. Processing your feelings is very, very important, but we process them so that we are not held hostage by them. Amen? We process our feelings so that we can release them to the Lord and continue keeping our eyes on him and move forward towards him so that our feelings do not pull us off course. How many of you have ever been led astray by your own feelings? and emotions. We have to fix our eyes on the Lord more than we trust in how we feel. So number one, focus. Number two, position. Position your practices to line up with your purpose. Position your practices to line up with your purpose. Now to be clear, what this means is make choices that reflect who and where you wanna be. Make choices that reflect who and where you want to be. Follow me on this one. If we are aware, if we are aware that Jesus is going to at some point ask us to step outside of the boat, right? Outside of the current season that we're in, the current situation that we're in. If we are aware of that, and we are aware that at some point he is going to ask us to take steps towards him through some maybe uncomfortable stuff, right? Then doesn't it just make good sense to position your boat as close to the presence of God as possible? Doesn't it just make good sense to position your life in close proximity to Jesus so that when he says this season is done, come to me for what's next, you're not having to run from all the way back there. Your task will be less uncomfortable if you position the practices of your life closer to God's presence. And the simple goal in this is that you just go to bed with a little less regret about what the day held, a little less regret about what you missed, a little less regret about, ah, I, didn't, I didn't express myself in the way that I should have in that moment. More time on things that develop your purpose and less time on things that pull you away from your purpose. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will what? He will draw near to you. So number one is to focus, number two is to position, and number three is to remember. 
Remember, your peace is not dependent upon your circumstance. Matthew 14, 32 said, when Jesus got in the boat, the wind died down. And in other places in the gospels, Jesus spoke to the water and it stopped. But this time, the water, the waves, the wind, the storm, it stopped when he got in the boat. And I believe it's because in this particular um, account of the story, he wants us to see that it is his very presence with us that calms the storms in our life. It was when he left the, the outside of the boat and got in the situation with Peter that the calm came. That was the moment. You can feel uncomfortable and know the presence of God and the peace of God at the very same time. Because when you are sitting right next to Jesus and you are walking with Jesus, you carry with you a peace and an understanding that God's got this. But the problem is too often that we run off in whatever direction we want, whatever direction we feel like going. And then we go, wait, God, where, where'd you go? God, where are you? And we left him back on the shore. We left God back there. We were struggling with the distance and the separation between Jesus and ourselves. And we're saying, God, where did you go? But really, it's our job to own that maybe you were moved by your discomfort instead of holding tight to your peace. Stay close to Jesus. Today I believe God is calling some of you to embrace the uncomfortable in your journey. The part of your journey that's not your sweet spot. Not your comfort zone. Not the spot that you're like, I love this. This is so great. I woke up just for this. Not that spot. Not that part. Because I believe he's asking us to get out of the safety of your little boat out of the safety of the season that you're in, the place that you're in, that you've grown accustomed to, that you have come to say, well, I have this duck just like this, this one just like that, and the other one just like that. I've got everything in the order that I like it, and it's wonderful. And the Lord's like, I'm gonna mess up your order now. Because don't get me wrong, our God is a God of order, absolutely. But the order of the kingdom is when we are in sync with God. The order of the kingdom is when we are listening and following after his lead, not making our own plans and then nailing our feet down there and not moving because we're like, I like this one. God, don't, don't shift my life. Today, I believe he's asking some of us to get out of the boat. Y'all, Jesus saw the storm that the disciples were in. He saw it from the shore. And he sees the situations that arise in your life too. Jesus could have spoken to the storm from the shore, but he chose to reveal himself in the middle of the storm instead. He demonstrated to them that he was greater than any storm could ever be. Y'all, sometimes he calms the storm, but sometimes he calls you out in the middle of it. Sometimes God will call you out. And where is your posture? Where are you positioned? Are you ready to be called out? When he says, just trust me, are you positioned to say, okay? Where are you when he says, get out of that boat and let me stretch you? Are you ready to say, all right, Lord? He needs us to continually be connected to him. And he wants us to be able to see him and know that he is the source of our strength and that he is the calm. The storm doesn't ever get to be the calm. The situation doesn't ever get to be the calm. The calm is always the same. It's always Jesus. It's always steady. It's always certain. It's always unshakable. It does not change but we have to cling to him as our calm, as our absolute calm, because there is more. But it is only available when you come to Jesus continually. Most people don't lack the drive 
to accomplish. They lack the willingness to be uncomfortable in the middle of the journey. Jesus did not avoid the uncomfortable. So I don't think we should. Amen? If we want to walk in power, if we want to be truly free, if we want to experience joy that just doesn't make sense, then we have to embrace the moments in life that God is leading us toward and refuse to run. Refuse to say, this feels uncomfortable. I'm out. Refuse. Nail those feet down, moving towards God and saying, I refuse to back down from the presence of God because this is my calm. This is my strength. This is my joy. Every single significant man and woman referenced in the Bible went through an uncomfortable moment or season before they did something great for the kingdom of God. Faith is not comfortable, but it's powerful. Service is not comfortable, but it's rewarding. Breakthrough is not comfortable, but it's encouraging. Growth is not comfortable, but it is strengthening. And relationship is not always comfortable, but it is truly satisfying for our hearts. Everything good in life has uncomfortable seasons. My challenge for you today is don't sink when you notice yours. When you notice the waves, don't sink. When you notice the storm, don't doubt. Just look even harder into the distance at Jesus and get closer and closer and closer and closer. So it's no longer about like, I'm trying to decipher if that's you, Jesus. No, I'm face to face with you. I know this is you. I'm certain of who you are. I know what you're saying because I can read your lips. I am well aware. Maybe you are in the boat right now in this season. Maybe you're in the boat in the spot that feels safe and you feel God kind of nudging at you to get out of that boat. Maybe you are out in the uncomfortable season and you are just doing your best not to sink right now. You are swimming, treading water as much as you can. Maybe that's the season that you're in. Or maybe you've kept your eyes on Jesus and he is using you in an incredible way. But for all of you, the encouragement is the same. Focus, position, and remember. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And then we go on to a part that we don't always read following Jeremiah 29, 11, that says, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I'm gonna invite you all to stand to your feet. We're gonna go back into worship here for just a couple more moments. I've asked the team to come and lead us in a song called I Surrender All. Because our prayer for you today is that you would surrender the comfort zone that you're in. You would surrender what you are willing to do and be for God. You would surrender the things that maybe you've held on to a little, little tight. Maybe you would release what's in your hand so that you can receive what God has for you next. I surrender. I surrender all. All to be my blessed Savior. I surrender. Towards heaven and sing it again. Say, I surrender.
Jesus, that you are such a faithful Lord. Thank you that you continually call us to come closer to you because of your great love for us. Thank you, Father, that you are continually challenging us to be closer to the person you called us to be, the greatest version of ourselves. Thank you, Father, that you recognize what boat we are in and what boat we need to get out of. And I pray for every person in this room, every person hearing my voice, and I pray that they receive your challenge. I pray that they hear your voice more clearly than ever before. And I pray that they would sense your heart for them. Even if they are not the nearest to you that they've ever been, and they don't even know exactly how to hear your voice clearly, I pray they would sense your heart for them. And I pray they would be encouraged by your love for them. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I wanna remind you, focus, position, and remember. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your savior, the reason that we do all of this is because we have a God that loves us so greatly. The Bible says in John 14, six, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to the Father is through him. We were all born into sin, but because of his great love for us, Jesus died on the cross and paid the price for all of our sins, for our old ones, for our current ones, for our future ones. And on that third day, he rose from the grave and that resurrection power allows us to live in freedom today. And maybe you're here and you would say, Jackie, I do feel uncomfortable in my life, but not because I'm, I'm hearing from Jesus, more because I don't know Jesus as my savior. And I want to, I wanna live free from sin, full of purpose and filled with hope. Romans 10, nine and 10 says to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. All it takes is your surrender. And maybe you're the second invitation and you would say, I used to know the Lord and I used to walk with him, but today I need to get back on track. I went too far away from him and I need to recommit my life to him today. If you are the first group that I mentioned and you would say, say today is the day for freedom and make Jesus the Lord of your life or the second you wanna rededicate. If either of those are you with boldness as an act of surrender and declaration that you wanna give your life to Jesus today or rededicate your life, I would ask you to lift up your hands in surrender to a mighty God. Amen, lift your hands if you wanna give your life to Jesus today. Amen, amen. Church, can we celebrate those? I see you. I see you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's all pray this prayer together today. Say, Jesus, today is my day. I wanna give my life to you. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for your forgiveness. And I repent now. From this moment on, I am choosing to live for you. You are my Father, you are my Savior, and you are my Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, amen.